Hey all, so today we're going to be looking at C3.2, which is the immune system. So we're looking at page 481 to 496. Uh, and the questions we're really asking here, are how do body systems recognize pathogens and fight infections? And then what factors influence the incidence of disease in populations? Um, so the interaction and interdependence, how are they interacting to recognize pathogens? How are pathogens being transmitted? And how are those things interconnected? So firstly, what's a pathogen? Uh, disease can be caused by genetics, the environment, or an infection. Pathogens are an infection molecule or structure. Pathogens are going to enter a body, reproduce, and cause disease. So they could be visible invaders like tapeworms, which are parasites. They could be viruses. They could be bacteria. Um, and so we have a list here of different types of pathogens that you might encounter. Hopefully not. So bacteria here, we have tuberculosis, gonorrhea, leprosy. We have funguses that can be problematic, athlete's foot uh, or thrush, uh, protists like malaria or toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is from cat poop. Um, viruses like the flu or Ebola or COVID, and then spongiform encephalitis. This uh, is from Kruchfeldt Jakob uh, disease prions. And so prions are proteins that turn other proteins into prions in your brain tissue. And this causes malfunction of your brain cells. Um, and, uh, it is hugely prob problematic. Um, there was an outbreak of this in the eighties or nineties, early nineties, uh, in cows. And so then people were very concerned and a number of cows had to be killed, uh, that people were eating that meat and also getting prions. Viruses are not alive. They can't re replicate solo. Um, and archaea do not infect humans. Uh, and so just a quick history lesson, <laughs> Jon Snow, who is not the character on Game of Thrones, but uh, instead was a scientist quite a long time ago. He was the first one who identified where cholera outbreaks were happening in the UK, in London, uh, around water pumps. And this was before scientists really understood how pathogens were transmitted or what they were. Um, but he was able to isolate around water pumps that cholera outbreaks were happening. And then they shut down the pumps and then people didn't get cholera and then they didn't die. Um, and then Ignaz Semmelweis, uh, he was looking at plural, I can never say this word, para, para, it's essentially inflammation of your lung, inside of your lung tissue. So um, pleuroparal fever, um, and this is caused by a bacteria and it was caused by a lack of hand washing and it was very common uh, for women giving birth back in the late 1800s, 1800s. And so hand washing was then uh, reduced because it obviously killed the bacteria, um, This the incidence of this lung infection. So for our bodies to prevent us from getting really sick, we have a primary line of defense. And so primary defense prevents entry of these pathogens into our body. And it can do that through skin, mucus, blood, uh, clots and our skin itself has a lower pH, which prevents bacterial growth, as well as having positive, uh, healthy bacteria on our skin that helps maintain, um, prevent, provides competition with other bacteria. So then, uh, pathogenic bacteria have a harder time growing. Mucus has lysozymes in it, uh, which are antibacterial. And uh, mucus is going to trap the pathogens, and then they're either swallowed, like through by macrophages, engulfed, or they're expelled. And then we have blood clotting. And so, what's going on with blood clotting is that we have clotting factors in our blood. And when a cut happens, platelets start releasing clotting factors, and those clotting factors are going to convert. Uh, some proteins, prothrombin to thrombin. So prothrombin is water soluble. So is fibrinogen. Those are both chill, just chilling in your bloodstream. When these clotting factors come along, prothrombin gets converted to thrombin and that triggers fibrinogen to uh, turn into fibrin. 
and fibrin is like the sticky mesh net that catches blood, uh, red blood cells and seals the hole. And uh, atherosclerosis can cause a clot, which it can lead to uh, strokes or heart attacks. And so what's going on there is in there's a narrowing of the blood vessel and you can have tissue damage that forms a clot inside your blood vessel. And then it rips off and travels to an alternate location and can block that blood vessel. So how is the immune system fighting infection? So we have the innate immune system that's going to respond to all pathogens, no matter what they are. This would be an example of this would be phagocytes. So phagocytic, meaning they are white blood cells that are going to engulf and break down pathogens. But then we also have the adaptive immune system, and that's going to respond in specific ways using antibodies. Um, and these are both secondary defense strategies. So remember our primary defense was mucus and blood clotting and skin. Secondary defense is this innate and adaptive immune system. And vaccines are going to allow the development of memory cells, which is part of this adaptive uh, immune response, so that antibodies can be made faster when the body does encounter a pathogen. And memory cells will slowly die, which is why you need booster vaccines. So if you are first exposed to the vaccine here, um, then you're going to have the primary immune response. This is slow. It takes longer. It's not super strong but it creates some memory cells. And then when the virus or pathogen actually comes along, you have a secondary response. It's much quicker, produces antibodies much, much faster and is much stronger. So then you can kill your, the invaders dead. And vaccines can be given orally or into the muscle or under the skin. And in some cases there's even a nasal spray. Um, these can be make, made with weakened or killed forms of the pathogen. It can be made from proteins off the pathogen or using messenger RNA. Uh, the COVID vaccine was a messenger RNA vaccine. And so what that meant was that they injected the messenger RNA into your cells and then your cells picked up that messenger RNA and actually started making COVID proteins that then your body responded to saying, what the heck are these? And developed memory cells to combat the proteins that were generated from those messenger RNA strands. So different types of immune cells. We have phagocytes. They're going to move out of the capillaries to an infection site, and they're going to digest invaders. We have macrophages. They also engulf pathogens, and then they rip off their antigens and display them. So macrophagia, what is an antigen? That is a protein marker on the surface of all cells. And so when they rip off pathogens, antigens, they're going to use them to activate these lymphocytes. And so lymphocyte, both of these are going to be uh, part of your innate immune response. They're going to uh, do this to all invaders. Lymphocytes are going to be part of your adaptive immune system. So they are going to produce antibodies that are large proteins that target specific pathogens, the antigens on those specific pathogens after they have been shown the antigen. So the macrophage comes into uh, the area where the lymphocytes are and says, hey, this is the antigen that I'm looking for. I need an antibody. And those, uh, they go around touching things until they find the right cell that can make that antibody. And once it becomes activated, then the antibodies are made and some of the cells that made those antibodies remain as memory cells. The antibodies are gonna tag the pathogen. So the antibodies clip onto the antigen on the pathogen and either will tag them, it's like waving a flag for the phagocytes to come collect them and eat them, or it will prevent the, ho the pathogen from docking to entering into the host cells. Antibodies irreversibly bind to antigens. So once those antibodies are on there, that pathogen is hooped. But we want a quick antibody response because otherwise it takes a long time to get those antibodies making, being made in your body. And it can result in a lot, lot, lot more viruses or bacteria in your body and a lot longer healing time. So here is this process of making antibodies. So we have helper T lymphocytes. They're going to take that displayed antigen from the macrophage, become activated, 
and carry it to a B lymphocyte to activate the B cell. Then the B cells are going to make clones of itself and they're going to grow. And the clones start making antibodies using their rough endoplasmic reticulum and their Golgi bodies. And some clones are going to persist inactive for a long time after the infection. These are memory cells and they can respond quickly in the event of a reinfection. So HIV, your body does produce antibodies for this virus, but the virus attacks the actual helper T cells. So the helper T cells here, they're the ones picking up the antigen and making, uh, being activated to then trigger the B cells to make antibodies. So if the HIV virus kills the helper Ts, then the B cells can't make antibodies. And slowly without treatment, almost all the white blood cells in your body are killed. And then you have full-blown AIDS. Um, and the immune system cannot respond any further to any pathogens. Um, and usually a person will pass away because of secondary infections, something like Carposi sarcoma. Um, so viruses, the HIV virus is found in blood and sexual fluids in the anus and breast milk and transmission can be through breast milk, childbirth, unprotected sex, um, sharing needles or blood transfusions. And when a person has AIDS, um, they show very rare diseases that usually can be fought off by the immune system. So HIV treatment um, is using antiretroviral drugs that impact the effectiveness of reverse transcriptase or enzymes that allow the DNA to enter the cell or to prevent assembly of new virus particles. So a lot, a lot of research has gone into addressing HIV and also treating HIV and antiretrovirals are quite amazing in that they can reduce your viral load to the point that if you have HIV, it would be very difficult for you to transmit HIV. But bearing in mind, antiretrovirals can be very expensive depending on the nation that you live in or almost impossible to acquire. So that can be a, a big limiting factor for that. Um, but it's very difficult to make a vaccine for HIV because of continuous mutation of the virus. So antibiotics, the way that these work, um, penicillin comes from a fungus and funguses compete with bacteria for dead stuff to eat. And so penicillin kills bacteria because it doesn't want it eating its food source. And uh, in 1928, this was discovered by Alexander Fleming in a totally fluke experiment where he had soaked some uh, Petri dishes in different fluids. And one uh, piece was next to uh, a piece of moldy bread, which had penicillin growing on it. And then the anti the bacteria didn't grow on those slides. I think that that's the story. Um, but then, so that was in 1928, but it wasn't actually until 1940 that Flory and Chain then created penicillin as a medicine. So bearing in mind at that time, World War II was happening. And a lot of people were dying because of septic infections. And so penicillin then became quite a critical aspect of treatment for soldiers who had been injured. Antibiotics work by blocking cellular uh, processes in prokaryotes, and they work on prokaryotes, which are what bacteria are, but they don't work on eukaryotes. Eukaryotic cells function differently than prokaryotic cells. So uh, antibiotics work well to kill bacteria in human bodies, but they're not going to kill us. And they also don't work against viruses because viruses don't have a metabolism. So that doesn't work. Um, you can't take antibiotics to cure a flu. And because some people do take antibiotics to cure a flu and antibiotics have been taken indiscriminately without regulation, there have now become resistance incidences of to antibiotics. So bacteria are multi-resistant to certain antibiotics. There is now multi-resistant, completely multi-resistant tuberculosis um, in some countries where the there are no antibiotics you can any longer take to address this problem. 
Um, and bacteria are able to share their plasmids to share resistance. They can also scavenge plasmids from dead bacteria, even if they're not the same species as them. And this is evolution in action. So over a 75 year, 80 year timeline, we can see bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics as we have naturally selected for the ones who are resistant. Um, docs, doctors must prescribe specific antibiotics only for very serious infection, none for livestock. A lot of antibiotic resistance has arisen because animals are kept in very unsanitary conditions. And as a byproduct of that, they get sick and then they need to be cured so that people can have meat and they are generating antibiotic resistance there. But the problem is that pharmaceutical companies don't want to make more because it takes 10 years for them to make an antibiotic. And then after 10 years, they are no longer functional. So they can't recoup the money that they would have gained from creating an antibiotic. So the future forward is probably a combo of antibiotics and phage therapy. In uh, what used to be the Eastern Bloc countries, there's a lot of information about phage therapy because they didn't have access to Western antibiotics when the USSR was a nation. And so um, more research is definitely being done these days in the EU for phage therapy and development of new antibiotics hopefully would be supported by government mandate. Um, and then... If you do get an infection related to, sorry, I was just looking at my notes here, uh, an infection related to a multi-drug resistant bacteria, it tends to be one in five people die. So zoonosis and herd immunity, many pathogens can only affect one species. When a pathogen jumps off of one species to another, this is called zoonosis. And so tuberculosis originally came from cows and humans drank the infected milk and then they got tuberculosis. Rabies comes from dogs via saliva or bats, for example. Uh, and then herd immunity is when a significant number of the population is immune due to sickness or vaccines, and then it's gonna prevent new outbreaks. So if I'm immune and you're immune and we're all immune nearby me, nobody's gonna get sick because we have resistance. We have memory cells, we have antibodies. And so if then we have an immunocompromised person nearby, Nobody's getting sick around them, so they're fine. But if none of us are vaccinated or none of us have gotten sick, then they can easily catch it because everyone around them is getting sick. And this kind of depends on what is your herd immunity number is relevant to your R value. So how many people would an infected people infect, an infected person infect? So measles has an R value of 15, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and so that means that an infected people will infect 15 people. Measles is highly, highly, highly contagious. And it also eradicates your immune system. It just wipes it completely out. And you have to start from scratch. So it's like you're a two-year-old again, and every bug that comes along, you get sick. So to achieve herd protection here, there's this formula, one minus one over the R value times by 100. So we need a 93% uh, vaccination rate to prevent measles outbreaks. Um, and if we have a lot of people vaccinated, then we prevent outbreaks. So blood clotting requires platelets to produce clotting factors, which changes prothrombin to thrombin and then fibrin and gin to fibrin. If you had hemophilia, which is a genetic disorder, you would not create the right clotting factors and then would not be able to clot your blood properly. The immune system fights pathogens with antibodies. Vaccines produce memory cells that allow your cells to make antibodies more quickly. HIV kills the helper T lymphocytes that activate B cells that make antibodies, which is eventually why HIV completely crushes your immune system and becomes AIDS. Bacteria can become resistant to antibiotic through irresponsible use of antibiotics and evolution, natural selection leading to evolution. Um, and then various types of lymphocytes help with adaptive immunity, while phagocytes are part of the innate immunity system. That's it for this video. I know it's a bit long. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.